Hi, everybody, and welcome to Big Joe's Journal. My name is Joe Tilden, and I am the host of this program. Well, we've just celebrated, I don't say celebrate, but commemorated 9-11, <clears throat> probably the worst uh, terrorist attack on U.S. territory. And I think, uh, you know, people that uh, were alive that day, it's sort of like when you lived through Pearl Harbor. You remember where you were. I know I was at home, and I think I was watching the uh, tail end of the CBS morning show. And for some reason or another, they were focused outside. There had been one, the first plane had already hit. And I'm looking at the TV and I say, man, that plane is flying real low for New York City. Next thing you know, crash into the, uh, into the other of the Twin Towers. And of course, the horrible tragedy that, uh, that occurred, the number of deaths and uh, the terrorism that, that struck the country. And then, of course, the second attack on the Pentagon and the third one when all those people in Pennsylvania put their, law, their own lives on the line to save other people's lives. You know, true, uh, true heroism, no question about that. And so 9-11 got us involved in the wars that seems to go on forever. We we're on the right track to go after bin Laden. But there was no reason to get involved in Iraq at that time. Our main target should have been to capture bin Laden. And the people that were responsible for 9-11 were Saudis, our allies from Saudi Arabia, our so-called allies from Saudi Arabia. There were no Iraqis involved in 9-11. But the powers that be in Washington, namely the Vice President, the Secretary of Defense at the time, for whatever reason, they wanted a war. And we had a President, George W. Bush, who, of course, the big improvement over the one we got now, but intelligence-wise, further up the scale, but not that much, got persuaded to uh, start a war in Iraq, for whatever reason. <clears throat> We should have focused on Afghanistan. <clears throat> and settle the issue with Osama bin Laden. Eventually it was settled when he was, of course, found to be hiding in Pakistan, another one of our so-called allies. And one of the reasons we were able to locate him was a uh, Pakistani doctor that was willing to cooperate with U.S. intelligence and to get some evidence so they could match up DNA and determine that that was bin Laden in the compound he was hiding in. <clears throat> so that we were able to, to uh, capture him and take him out and bury him at sea. And unfortunately, the doctor that helped us, he was arrested by Pakistani authorities. And we never did anything to get him out of jail. He cooperated with us. Then we didn't need him anymore. We're letting him rot in jail in Pakistan. And why is he in jail in Pakistan? Because he helped a foreign power perform an act in Pakistani territory. <clears throat> I mean, if you look at all the money that we poured into Pakistan and the help we've given them, and the way we're defending Saudi Arabia, it was the crown prince of Saudi Arabia <clears throat> who authorized the kidnapping and the butchering of an American citizen. Our current leader asked him, said, did you have anything to do with the killing of this American citizen? And of course, the crown prince lying through his teeth said, no, don't know anything about it which was a blatant lie, and the fibber in the White House went along with it. What we should have done is said, all right, you've butchered an American citizen, now you're going to pay a price. Terminate all military aid to Saudi Arabia. And say, well, 
If Iran wants you, Iran can have you. Also, it's interesting to note that I believe about a year ago, some Saudi cadets in this country were ushered out. They're over here learning how to uh, fly military aircraft. And at the same time, they were, were plotting a terrorist project against the United States. Again, part of the Saudi military, supposed to be our allies. And here they are, plotting more destruction in this country. <clears throat> Fortunately, we had the good sense to get rid of them. Send them back to their home country and say, well, we caught you this time, guys. It's not going to happen. We had fire 19 years ago. It's hard to believe that 9-11 was 19 years ago. You know, time flies. And right now, in 2020, we're looking at another huge tragedy affecting our mainland, mainly the fires out on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, now spreading in Idaho. The air quality in San Francisco, in Seattle, in Portland, it's the worst it's ever been. They're telling people to stay inside. Stay inside. There's a soot in the ash, and it's like night out there all the time. The governor of California blames it on climate change, and that has something to do with it. But Mother Nature is hitting the West Coast hard. They've been affected by a drought, a huge drought. There's a lot of dry wood, and you get high winds and a lot of dry land, no water, those things happen. Communities have been destroyed. People have been killed, burned to death. You think of the, the horror of burning to death. The number of animals that have been lost. For example, animals that are in barns and some of the farms that have been destroyed. They have no way of getting out, and they're just plain incinerated. A horror story taking place on our west coast, four of our states. And here in the east, we're going through a minor drought, but nothing like they have out in the west. It shows maybe that um, the northeast is not such a bad place to live after all. Down in Louisiana, they're awaiting the arrival of another storm. I believe it's uh, the name of this one is Susan. It's going to hammer somewhere around uh, the New Orleans again. So those folks have just just barely recovering from the last two, and they're going to get smacked again. So Mother Nature is acting up, and it seems that it is targeting the mainland United States and hammering certain parts of this country and hammering it hard. We have COVID-19. People seem to want to downplay that a little bit, but it's still there and still a challenge. Over the weekend, I watched uh, college football on Saturday, Notre Dame and Duke. Notre Dame is the only major school in the Midwest that is playing football, although as a result of their game with Duke on Saturday, the Big Ten Conference, which is actually 14 schools, is rethinking their position of not having football this fall. Major college football is a major economic factor in these college towns. The number of people that come in, the restaurants, hotels, everything, and without it, they're taking an economic hit. So there's a lot of pressure on the Big Ten to say, well, let's recrank the football season. The teams are at school, at least most of them. They are working out. 
So it would take a matter of a week or two weeks to get up and play another truncated schedule. Maybe instead of 12 games, uh, play seven, play eight. For the NFL, doesn't seem to be a problem. They had a full schedule yesterday, so we'll see what happens from there on down. The coaching staff are all wearing face masks, but of course the players weren't. And football is a game of close, close physical contact. Those of you that uh, were wondering how Tom Brady was going to do in his new team, didn't do very well. He was totally outplayed by Drew Brees as the Los Angeles Saints defeated Tampa Bay. I don't recall what the final score was, but it was something like 34 to, uh, 34 to 17 maybe, or 34-24, but I think it was 34-17. So Tom Brady got off to kind of a bad start. I think he had uh, th through three, maybe four interceptions. One was for a touchdown. But his debut with Tampa Bay uh, did not go well. So we'll see how it goes from there. Meanwhile, his old team, the Patriots, uh, defeated Miami 21 to 11. Game played at Foxborough with their new quarterback who was a uh, head case Scored two touchdowns, had a great day for himself. Won't be long before that goes to his head. As you know, he was quarterback Carolina when they went to the Super Bowl. The headlines were Superman is coming to the Super Bowl and he's bringing his teammates with him. Well, as it turned out, uh, Denver knocked him off by playing a great defensive game. And Superman was brought down to earth so finally, Carolina released him this past year, and he's, uh, the Patriots picked him up. I was rather disappointed when they did. I was hoping that they would pick up the former starting quarterback at Cincinnati, who lost his job to the uh, uh, that young rookie that the Cincinnati drafted out of LSU, who carried the LSU National Collegiate Championship last year. In the meantime, baseball, of course, the truncated season begins winding down. We're in the last two weeks before we get into the playoffs. You know, you have baseball, and what you see in the stands are all these cutouts. Maybe one or two people, probably the grounds crew is there somewhere. But it's been a 60-game season it's been a staggering season. It's been a pitiful season for the Red Sox. Pitiful. But for a lot of other teams where the COVID-19 has set in, particularly Miami, a number of games have had to be canceled. This weekend, uh, the series between San Diego and San Francisco in the National League was canceled. Mainly because of COVID-19, but also because of the uh, air quality out in the San Francisco area. So big problems. Problems caused by global warming perhaps. Certainly Mother Nature is uh, changing her approach and she's not looking very kindly on us, that is for sure. Now the situation we have in the West and what we've had in the middle of the country. And now New Orleans is going to get socked again. For our neck of the woods, we're going to experience an early frost. I was thinking back the past years, you know, when this was fair week. And we would have warm, warm, sunny days and chilly evenings. And that is the pattern that was sort of followed last week where we had some beautiful days, some beautiful warm sunny days and nights that were, were chilly. I think there was only one night really when it got down to the high 40s. But uh, this week we're going to be getting down into the low 40s, in some cases darn close to freezing. And there's a possibility, you know, that uh, we may have our first frost, which is a little earlier than expected. And with the first frost, of course, a lot of our 
growing plants and garden crops and so forth, it means uh, the summer's over. And we're going to settle back and enjoy a beautiful fall, we certainly hope. And of course, right behind that comes a season a lot of us don't like to think about. But unfortunately, it has become an economic, almost an economic necessity, particularly here for the state of Vermont. How the foliage season will do, we're, go we're going to have beautiful foliage again. And how many uh, leaf beavers will we have in the state? Well, that, uh, that remains to be seen. Many people that would come from other states, of course, now with the current situation, they would be required to quarantine for 14 days. and They aren't going to want to do that. And our schools are back in session. Kids are competing in the various high school sports. They're going to have rather a, a different version of football this year. In many ways, it's going to, going to be fairly beneficial in the fact that the schools aren't going to be traveling all over the state. They're going to take the various classifications and merge them all into one. And they're going to play in their section of the state of Vermont. The state's been divided into four sections. Rather ironical thing, the first uh, game of the season, of course, Poultney High will be playing at Rutland High. And that's something you wouldn't see if things were, uh, well, I'll use the word normal, but I don't think we're ever going to go back to that. I think the COVID virus is something that's here to stay. It's going to be like the flu virus. And I would recommend, you know, that everybody possibly can get a flu shot. I'll be getting one uh, the end of September. It's better to be safe than sorry. And a little shot in the shoulder, um, you don't even feel it. The nurse comes in and, you know, especially if it's a young one, you don't even mind it. Give you a shot in the shoulder, it will give you protection of some sort during the year. If you do get bogged down a little bit, it won't be as bad as it would have been if you didn't get the shot. And also, it's going to be a protection of having that flu not lead into COVID-19, which would be even worse. The prediction is, of course, we're still waiting to see the results of Labor Day when people got together. We're seeing in many of our colleges when the students came back after being cooped up and being with mom and dad since uh, the previous March, they were anxious to get back with their old buddies, get back to the old uh, drinking parties and um, with their, the gentlemen with their lady friends and vice versa. And the result was, all of a sudden, a lot of people testing positive for COVID-19. Some cases like at Notre Dame and North Carolina and um, there was one other school that had to shut down and then reopen again. And I'm noticing the Notre Dame game, the way they had students scattered around the stand, I don't think there are any, uh, I think the people that were allowed to uh, view the football game were mainly students because a lot of them are doing things, you know, that uh, they normally wouldn't do if mom and dad were there. There's some uh, group of young ladies imitating the uh, Rockettes and enjoying themselves and having a good time. You know, if mom and dad were there, they probably wouldn't be doing that. I don't think they were thinking far enough ahead to realize that probably mom and dad are watching on TV. But they're having a good time, and that's the important thing. And the other important thing is that they not come down with COVID-19. with uh, COVID We are still waiting to see the results of what happens with our public schools here in Vermont and all over the country that have opened. I mean, some schools, kids are back in the classroom. They are separated as much as they can be. And uh, others are going to be going to uh, school by, by Zoom or computer, TV, whatever. 
You know, as a former teacher, the best way for learning to take place is that relationship, that personal relationship between the teacher and the student. And you don't have that when the kids are watching you from a distance on TV or on Zoom or on their computer. You don't really learn. I know, as I said two or three weeks ago when I was over at uh, Castle University, I was surprised by the number of students that are on campus. And they're going to be, they're going, to be going to class on Zoom. And I'm saying, you know, why, why are they back on campus when they're not going to be in a classroom with a professor getting direct instruction? They're going to be getting it on Zoom. Well, I can see why mom and dad might be a little fed up with son and daughter at home, restless, with a lot of energy, not really happy at being quarantined at home. And probably they were driving each other nuts. So they said, well, it's, it's to our mental health to get them back on campus so we can have a little peace and quiet. And they're probably willing to, to ante up that cost of room and board to get them out of the house. You know, I, I can understand that. But also noticing the number of students that were in groups that weren't wearing face masks. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that works out. So far, as far as we know, things are going all right at, uh, as they call it now, CU. In my day, it was Castle and State College, CSC. But um, that was a lot of years ago. And times do change, and the campus, of course, has grown a lot, probably doubled in size since I was there. And uh, the student body has increased quite a bit. And the people that are running the show are, uh, well, the folks that were there when I was there, a number of them are deceased by now, and all are retired. But the, the, spirit, the spirit goes on. And that, that's the important thing. And another thing, of course, as you know, we're on a stretch run. Elections will be coming up. November 3rd is the big day. A very, very important election here in this country. Whether we want to retain democracy or whether we want to uh, maybe go into a tin horn dictatorship type of government. That's the importance of this election. It's not necessarily the candidates, but it's the type of government we're going to have. Are we going to maintain our democracy? Or are we going to continue to have an individual who thinks he's a, uh, an imperial uh, dictator? As you know, our federal government right now has really fallen down on the job. We have no leadership, no intelligent leadership out of the White House. The House of Representatives is doing its job, the Senate is not. And we more or less have government in free fall. People are saying, well, maybe democracy is not for us. Of course it is for us. Right now it's being challenged. It's being challenged that want to destroy it. That's why Russia's supporting Trump, because they know they've got a puppet in the White House. They've had one for four years. These other dictators around the world, they're looking at Trump and saying, go for it. The guys know better than they are. The guys know better than Adolf Hitler. If you like Donald Trump, you would have loved Adolf Hitler, and vice versa. Trump is no better. Everything he does is for him, not for the country. He has confused patriotism with loyalty to him personally and not to the country. 
Anybody that would talk about our military the way he did, calling them suckers and dopes, those who have made a supreme sacrifice, those that go in and put their lives on the line. It's not an easy thing to do, but we have many, many, many dedicated Americans, men and women, who are loyal to this country and who are willing to serve this country and who put their lives on the line. Look at, go back, well, let's just go back to World War II and the number of Americans that saved the world, the greatest generation. Those who answered the call in Korea and made the supreme sacrifice. Vietnam, that divided the country, a war we never should have been involved in. And yet when the country called, thousands of young Americans responded. They said, this is my country and I'm going to serve it. Right or wrong, I'm going to serve it. Over 58,000 of them made the supreme sacrifice. And then we come to our more modern day wars in Afghanistan, the number of lives we're losing in Afghanistan. And over there we're propping up a government which is as, probably as corrupt as any that ever came down the line. The number of casualties in Iraq. And we have the double cross this administration pulled on our allies, the Kurds. The Kurds who fought valiantly and in many cases carried the brunt of the war against ISIS. In, for the most part, crushing ISIS, but now it's started to revive a little bit. And when Russia Turkey decided that they wanted to get rid of ISIS. Fathead in the White House agreed, and we double-crossed our allies to our shame, definitely to our shame. So a big, big decision, and the people have to make it. And it's going to be very, very easy to vote. You can vote by mail. And every state in the Union, I do believe, are going to be sending out ballots. They should be coming out very, very shortly, at least by the end of this month. And you'll be able to vote at home if you can't get to the polls. And even if you can't get to the polls, you can always vote absentee by calling your town clerk or your city clerk and ask for an absentee ballot. But if we're going to reclaim democracy, and we're going to make this country great again, and I mean really great, not this mega thing that they've got going on now with their little red hats, but really make this country great, really return democracy. Because democracy is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, and we don't have that now. We're losing it, and we're going to lose it even more if we keep the current administration there. But you want to get your country back? You want to revive democracy? You want to make this nation what it should be and what it can be and what it will be again? If people stand up and say we're sick and tired of what's going on now, we want a functioning federal government. Vote. The only time change is going to take place is going to take place through legislation. And who does the legislation? The people that are elected to represent the people. And the only way they're going to get there is you turn out and you vote. And vote from your heart. Look at the issues and look at where we're going. Ask yourself this. Are you better off today than you were four years ago? 95% of the people can honest, be honest with yourselves and say, no, we're not. And as a nation, we're not. And if you think we're in trouble, look at the situation we've got now. And look at the leadership, or lack of leadership, that we have now. Look at our standing in the world. Four years ago, we were numero uno, number one. And where are we now? We're way down the ladder. Number one, probably China. Number two, probably Russia. 
But where are we? Vote, people, vote. With that, may Almighty God and his infinite wisdom continue to bless these United States of America. God love you, and we'll see you all next week.